You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Hey guys, this is Brian Lenny of Mining Stock Education and JuniorStockReview.com. Uh, today with me, I have Kobe Kushner of uh, Red Cloud. Uh, Kobe is a, a mining engineer and an analyst. And today we'll be discussing the lithium sector. And, you know, I think the best place to start is the basics. Uh, the lithium market, I would say out of maybe, maybe not all the metals, but, uh, you know, it doesn't fit into the mainstream yet, I don't think. And so I think we should get off to uh, starting talking about the different deposit types and get a good base before we get into some more of the details. So Kobe, um, there's a variety of different lithium deposits out there. Can you take us through what those are? Sure. I mean, the two big ones are the hard rocks. And with that primarily comes from Australia. And then the other half of production is the brines. And that comes from uh, the lithium triangle in South America. Um, there's also some operations in other parts of the world as well. Uh, give or take, it's about five total operations, five or six that ac account for like over 80% of global lithium production. Okay. And so just a question, the, the brines in the hard rock deposit, um, is a brine just a, is, is it a, is it formed from weathering of the, the hard rock? Is that how a brine is formed? No, the, the hard rocks, I, honestly, I'm not sure. I, I don't know how they're formed. There's different theories as to what makes these salars there. When I say brines, you know, these are saltwater lakes in South America. Most of the time, there's also other uh, brine uh, sources like what we have in Western Canada, um, which come from uh, oil field reservoirs. And then there's also geothermal brines, but generally, uh, you know, we're talking about the salars that we see in Argentina and Chile and, uh, and Bolivia. Um, generally people believe that they originate from volcanic ash. Um, and then the hard rock lithium, they come from a type of granite, uh, called pegmatite usually. And then there's also some unconventional sources of lithium, like the sedimentary type, which includes clays that we see a lot in, uh, in Southwest U S. Okay, but like you said, the, the the majority of production, at least at this point, comes from the the brines and the the hard rock. The clay, yes, is is kind of the 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 smaller portion of that. There's no there's no current uh, commercial clay producer right now. Okay, well, why is that? Is that is this a matter of cost or what's the? I think companies are still trying to figure out how to crack into it um, on the metallurgy side. Um, and lots of companies are doing good work. I think major, or I, th I think companies are starting to put more faith into it. Uh, you know, Gangfang Lithium, a Chinese major lithium company, did help design the Thacker Pass uh, flow sheet, for example. And they also purchased the the Bacanora uh, clay operation in Mexico. So, so there is a lot of money being thrown at it, and you know, there's different ways on the metallurgy side to to actually get the lithium out of it, but it's, it's tough. It's not easy to get lithium out of clays. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's a good answer. Um, so, you know, we've got the deposit types kind of where the production is coming right now. So they get this lithium out of the ground and what's the product that they're delivering to these battery makers or um, actually, you know, actually before we get into that, batteries is the first thing that comes to mind but what are the uses for lithium like prior to maybe 2018 or 2019 yeah. what was lithium being used for yeah you're right I, I i believe it was 2018 when most uh global lithium demand the majority actually shifted to batteries everything before that you know batteries were obviously a growing market but uh often in in glass and ceramics industry as well as medical you know people take lithium uh as a as a medicine Okay. So, and so now battery represents the the biggest portion of yes. that. Um, so the question I was going to go to is, uh, so the, they, they, they extract the lithium out of the ground. They have uh, some secondary metallurgy. What are the, what is the the product that is created to deliver to the battery makers? What are the, the producers trying to produce? Yeah. The final end product, which usually originates uh, from China um, is, is a, is a either a, carbonate or a hydroxide, a lithium hydroxide or a lithium carbonate. And that's what gets used in the batteries. 
what's the what's the the difference because i've seen in different uh literature you know they talk to you know one guy says oh you, it has to be a carbonator the other guy says it has to be a hydroxide and i don't know what the exact current statistic was but the last time i looked at it the market was almost 50 50. um so is there kind of like a high level idea of what the difference between the two is and 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 how it's used yeah so they are used in different types of battery chemistries um the nickel rich uh, cathode, they, they typically require um, hydroxide. So that's kind of like your NCM batteries, for example, they'll require, those, then those are kind of like your higher, used in like the higher end EVs to get longer range. Um, whereas LFP, they use carbonate battery. So carbonate would be less energy density. Uh, but they're used in LFP batteries, and that's kind of like a, a nickel-free and, and cobalt-free uh, solution. And we are seeing increasing uh, demand for LFPs, especially in, in China. I believe they actually now dominate uh, market share in terms of production in China right now. Um, if you asked us, <laughs> you know, if you, years ago, and I'm talking, you know, five years ago, maybe, uh, no one saw this coming. No one saw the rise of LFPs. The the idea was that, oh, it's, you know, everyone wants hydroxide um, because that's what we need for the the uh, the NMC type batteries. So, um, but, it, you know, it goes to show, you know, there is still demand for um, lower range EVs, especially in places like China. Oh, it makes sense. Like the, well, whether it's substitution or the, the just range of demands for consumers, like that you know, markets are so tough to predict they, these things come up. And yeah, like you said, no one could have predicted it. Um, so do you foresee like the, the market basically staying like a 50, 50 moving forward, or do you think one will be more dominant than the other? Uh, it's, it's hard to say, honestly, just, you know, it, battery chemistries change all the time and there's always innovations and uh you know you know maybe in certain markets like north america i think i think hydroxide will be the preferred choice for now um but i i still think lfp has a place here in north america and uh it, one, one example of an innovation would be solid state batteries which don't use either um but they still they use lithium in, in metal form lithium metal um I don't think lithium is going away from uh, EV batteries anytime soon. Okay. So in terms of substitution, because uh, it's interesting, because I had this conversation when I was talking about nickel with, with an analyst and we talked to, you know, the LFP and how that's kind of come in and, and change things. Um, so like you said, you don't foresee in the short term anyway, something coming in and, you know, superseding or substituting lithium. I don't like there's a lot of talk about other types of batteries, whether that's sodium based or um, or vanadium redox flow batteries. Just as a, as a note, like if you've ever Googled a, a picture of a vanadium redox flow battery, they're huge, right? Like they're bigger than the, the room that I'm in. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's not something that will ever go on an EV in, in my view. Um, lithium is hard to substitute. You know, you can maybe substitute the nickel, substitute the cobalt, um, but lithium is the lightest metal on the periodic table, right? It's number three. It's the lightest, and it gives you that energy density. Uh, the other thing about it is, sure, prices are high, and that might incentivize people to want to substitute out of it. But in, in the grams, in the total cost of an EV, it's still a small portion, um, and and it's not it's not geographically sparse lithium production is 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 uh, very much concentrated on a few jurisdictions sure but i i think that's going to change okay that that brings me to i think the next most important question is jurisdiction you know worldwide over the last year two years we've seen i don't know if it's necessarily deglobalization but it sort of feels like it or nationalization of, of things but it'd be manufacturing yeah. or whatever and so when it comes to lithium um maybe take us through like you, you touched on you know the the lithium triangle in south america um australia i think is probably the biggest source of hard rock lithium um but how is that sort of developing from a jurisdictional standpoint or how do you see it developing 
I think countries are locking or cracking down on trying to secure their domestic supply chain of critical metals. And uh, lithium is deemed a critical metal in lots of countries, right? Including Canada, including the US. Um, so countries are all trying to secure their own domestic supply because there's not enough lithium production right now. Um, we saw this week um, Zimbabwe cracked down on it as well, right? They said that they'd stop exporting their lithium. And they, you know, that's they don't produce that much on a global scale. They only produce about 1.4% of global lithium raw material supply. But uh, it just goes to show. And, and earlier this year, we saw Mexico say that they're going to nationalize uh, lithium. And they only have like one actual advanced asset, which is the one I spoke about earlier, the Bacanora clay asset. Yeah. Can Canada, Canada, you know, a politically stable uh, jurisdiction, they forced divestment uh, from, uh, they forced Chinese divestment from three lithium juniors not that long ago. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point. So let's talk about Canada a little bit closer because, you know, besides Namaska and Quebec, I don't and that that story is maybe even long gone out of people's minds. I maybe. Um, but where what does lithium exploration in look like in Canada moving forward? Where is it going to be concentrated? Do you think right now it's very much concentrated in Quebec, um, some in Ontario as well. But we're seeing so much interest in Quebec. Companies are itching to get in there. Uh, the Aussies have totally moved in and they're they're still eager to break into Quebec as well. Um, and then there's also a couple of restarts being planned, Namaska being one of them. And the other one would be the past producing North American lithium. Um, so those will be coming online, you know, in the next couple of years, give or take. And then uh, I think we're also going to see increasing investment out West, which is kind of underneath a lot of people's radar. Um, and that's from the Canadian brines. So as I mentioned before, Canada has brines. Vast is some of the biggest lithium deposits in the world, actually. And so, but these brines don't take the the, the form of a solar like they do in South America, right? Like you're having to drill down to these. Is it sort of like drilling for an oil or gas well? Is it's, that the same idea? It's very similar. And I, I, I want to touch on, because everyone, well, I presume a lot of people listening to this, uh, you know, understand hard rock mining to some extent. Um, so to touch more on the Solaris, one of the reasons that they're very concentrated in the lithium triangle in South America is because it has the weather to allow us to actually concentrate the lithium. So the way that they do it in South America is, as well as Nevada, is they use evaporation, right? They, they, they drill a well, they pump it out, and they let it rest in these shallow ponds for months and months until and let the sun do its work in order to get a, a lithium concentrate. And, you know, Canada doesn't have evaporation uh, amenability, right? It, it's not a hot arid desert. You, you <laughs> just can't do it. So this is where DLE or direct lithium extraction comes into play. Okay. So this is, I want to say it's a new technology, but it's actually been around, uh, you know, for a while now. Um, no one right now is using just pure DLE commercially. Um, how it's being used right now, at least in, in uh, South America and perhaps China, is they use it in conjunction with evaporation. But, uh, you know, very, you know, record high lithium prices have incentivized um, investment into this technology. And it's not, it's not just one technology. It's, it's several technologies. There's many ways to do it. Um, and if I want to just quickly, you know, describe it, um, it, it's, it, think about it like a coffee filter, right? So, you know, you run your, your coffee with the grinds in it and it goes through this coffee filter. Um, you end up with water, well, coffee on one side, and then you get your coffee grinds on top of this filter, right? It's like a filter. And then you can, you just scrub off your coffee grinds, pretend your coffee grinds are your lithium. Of course, the process is, you know, it's not exactly like that, but that's a, a, an analogy. Okay. And, and so what do you think it's going to take? Is it just time before that becomes commercially viable? Is that 
what the only thing standing or does it need more money uh to be put in to make that technology expandable and and to have a high enough production rate to make it economic i think it's i think it's both time and investment we are seeing investment now and companies are moving quick uh you know we've ha- we've seen field demonstration plants already um in Saskatchewan and i think we're, we're going to be seeing one next year in Alberta um and that company is E3 Lithium which is a stock i cover so i have a i have a buy rating it's ETL on the venture and i have an $8.20 target um they're looking to to run their uh DLE pilot in the first half of next year okay so it so, is the juniors that are pushing that forward yes. okay interesting yes generally so so like one major lithium producer for example livent they do use dle down in argentina um but they use it in conjunction with evaporation so yeah it's it's i i think innovation generally comes from smaller companies right it's it's there's a lot of red tape with bigger companies and i also think innovation also comes from uh out of necessity right like if you to, to quote Raymond Chow who who's a CFO at E3 and I won't quote him exactly but he he brought up a good point like if you told him years ago that there's no way you could get oil from sands or that there is a way to get oil from sands he would have laughed at you right and you know it's it look lo and behold we're producing oil from sands yeah fair enough that's a good point so is does the proliferation of of direct extraction does that maybe is that a key for maybe clay deposits does that open up a door do you think to clay yeah yeah i do i i i don't think it's the only uh potential out uh the potential solution for the clays um but uh i think it could help you know companies like uh cyprus in nevada cyprus development they're looking at using dealy okay yeah this is clayton valley you're talking about right yes Okay. Um, so going back to the, the jurisdictional question, I think one of the interesting things is that, you know, the, you talked about, you know, I don't know if it was a 50% you said comes from the, uh, Solaris. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, a major part of the world production and probably will be for, you know, at least in the short term future, we've seen the Chinese make a number of investments, um, especially in Argentina, the Argentinian side of the, of the, uh, the, the Solars or the Brines Lithium Triangle. So do you foresee the same things moving forward? It, like, is there a potential issues there in the future, do you think, in terms of maybe ownership, but the nationalization? Like, is there potential for anything to happen in the, the Lithium Triangle? Because you know, Bolivia itself is, is which is the, the north part of, of the Triangle, and it has its own issues. But do you foresee any issues happening in the other, like with the Chinese owning a big portion of it? You've obviously, the other countries in South America want a, 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 probably a piece of this in the future. Um, how do you see that developing? Um, look, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if South America wanted to form their own OPEC okay. of lithium. Yeah. I don't know how that'll play out with the Chinese, of course, but you know, they, they are, they, they do produce about half the world's lithium. So. Yeah. So they're a major player, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And, so in terms I think of, they'll, they'll continue to be, and I think other South American countries will it, it, not even just from Solaris, but I think hard rock exploration in South America is also ramping up especially in Brazil, but also Argentina. Are, are, is the, is the brine, uh, or the brine concentrating mechanism in the secondary refining, is that a, is that necessarily more complex than the hard rock? Like it, it, what I'm trying to say is like, is there an advantage to the, like, obviously when you have nature being part of your secondary refinement, this is a huge advantage economically. So in comparison, I guess, technologically, technologically, and from an economic standpoint, is there a big difference between the brines and the hard rock? I'm going to say yes. I think so. Generally hydroxide, uh, comes from spodumene or the hard rock sources. Okay. And so it's a lot easier to take your, the, the way that the hard rocks work generally is that they, the mines themselves produce like a, a 6% spodumene concentrate spot or 
or Li2O concentrate. And they'll ship that off uh, to do some to do the downstream processing. They turn that into a lithium sulfate. And that it's a lot easier to go from spodumene to the concentrate to uh, lithium sulfate and then towards uh, hydroxide. Whereas a lot of the brines, it's it's a lot tougher to go uh, to hydroxide and could be okay. could be more expensive. Okay, I see. I see. So then, you know, the the fifty percent production uh, is definitely a big, a big. Uh, I'm not negotiating, but a, it's a it's a big advantage for the, for those countries. Um, but it's not necessarily on the economic side of things where they have an advantage of not only in production but also in the economics. So it's they they do have a playoff there too against the the hard rock sources um, in in terms of economics. Look, it's not like one. It's not. It's not so black and white. Like you can have a, a brine producer that's able to produce uh, lithium chemical for cheaper than uh, hard rock, okay. and vice versa. And so, vice versa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. The, the cost curve is is quite is relatively scattered in terms of where uh, you know you get the lowest cost uh, on an on a lithium carbonate equivalent basis. Um. Uh, with regards to being hard rock or brine. Okay. Um, so kind of talking about, it's still on the same kind of uh, talk on security of supply and, and jurisdictional uh, risk or, or by jurisdiction. Have we seen battery makers begin to make investments or strategic investments in the juniors? Like, is this is this going on on a global scale? Compared to last cycle, we're seeing more and more big players uh making investments into non-producing assets. So I'll say yes, I think so. Um, so not, not just battery makers, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking uh, automakers, EV makers, Tesla signing a deal with Lion Town Resources, for example, as well as, and it's not a lithium company, but Talon Metals, for example. Another point talking about uh, security of supply is, you know, the European Union came out with sort of a guideline that they want to push towards um, in restricting the carbon footprint associated with the battery metal makeup. So the ingredients that go into their batteries. Uh, so, Kobe, where's the production of lithium coming from in Europe? <laughs> There's not a lot of production coming out of Europe. Um, you know, I'm, we're talking maybe just Portugal right now. And it's a very, very small amount. Uh, next countries to maybe start producing, um, you know, in the UK, um, perhaps uh, in Germany, if Vulcan Energy can get their DLE up and running. And then uh, may, perhaps Finland in about 2025, give or take. But it's it's going to be tough for Europe to achieve that, in my view. Uh, it's it's an inter interesting point to, and I think it's very bullish. You know, considering a lot of that demand worldwide. Um, not not only that, like to add on to it, there's so many converters being brought online in uh, in in Europe, and it's like, okay, where are you going to source? source where, where's your feed coming from? <laughs> <laughs> like, how come no one's thinking about this? It seems to be a. Di it, I think everyone's working the wrong way. Like they're looking at, okay, we need we got electric cars coming. Okay, we need battery plants. Okay, we we need some converters here, and they're they're thinking about the resource last when maybe they should be thinking about that a lot earlier on. Oh yeah, that that's an excellent point. It really the the whole the whole thing, not just on the lithium side, but the whole battery, whether you know it's nickel or copper, um, it's going to be get really interesting when it comes to supply. So that kind of maybe brings it's a good opening for the the next question. And I was wondering if you could recap kind of what has happened in the the lithium market in 2022. Like I've seen some valuations. I've been watching the market from afar. Some companies have, you know, seen their share price spike huge. So what what has been driving the market in 2022? I think it's a lack of supply. Companies are scrambling to to secure that new supply. We saw lithium prices jump uh, or chemical prices jump over well over 700 percent this year. Um, we saw some equities make a jump, but, uh, you know, generally most are not up 700 percent, but still a significant amount. Um, which is just to go on a tangent there, Brian, as well, you know, if, if we look at gold, generally 
the gold equities are leveraged to uh, gold price on a more than a one to one basis, right? Like if, if gold price moves 1%, the equities move more than 1%. Um, I haven't seen that necessarily translate over to lithium equities. So while everyone is saying, hey, it's still the, the lithium market, they're, they're all too hot right now. Like, okay, but maybe they haven't appreciated enough fundamentally. Uh, to, to go back to uh, your question, companies have been rambling for new supply. I think we've been, um, we traditionally, you know, when people are looking at metal prices or material prices, uh, they're looking at the cost curve. How much does it cost to get a ton of lithium on an LCE basis out of the ground? And we have become so far disconnected, right? In gold, it's it's about, if, if you're lucky, you're selling it for um, twice the cost to get it out. And for lithium chemical, you're looking at over 10 times that. So it, it's almost like the cost curve doesn't matter right now. It, and it just shows that end users are are scrambling to, to secure any kind of supply that they can. There's no idle supply available. And that's why prices have rocketed. So does that, that that's interesting because there's always this kind of way, or at least in my head, is weighing the effect of, let's say, a recession. And it goes into my next question is, how do you foresee 2023? Because there's a threat of recession on the horizon, or maybe we're in it. And so how does that play off with the supply and demand fundamentals? Like, can a recession supersede that? It, it's it's hard to say, to be honest. I mean, in 2023, a lot of analysts are forecasting a, a the lithium market to return to surplus um, on the back of weakened demand numbers. Um, that surplus isn't going to be significant. You know, they're talking they're talking two thousand tons um, on an LCE basis. The other aspect of the, of that, and we touched on it earlier, is that not all lithium chemical is equal, right? So. Uh, other analysts are saying, like, yep, on a total LCE basis, we're going to see a, a small little surplus as opposed to the of, of 2,000 uh, tons, give or take, as opposed to the 15,000 uh, ton deficit we saw this year. Um, but if you look, if you just control for battery grade lithium, it's still expected to be in deficit. So in terms of how that's going to affect pricing, I'm not sure. I, may, I mean, I'm, I'm expecting a little more volatility. Um, volatility does work both ways, but I'm not expecting prices to, to crash back down to historic highs because supplies are still tight. And companies, um, uh, sure, lots of them do think on the short, short term, but I think the smart companies that are trying to scramble for resources right now are thinking on a much longer time horizon. And maybe you could just offer your opinion because the one interesting thing I saw, like, you know, the, in the States, uh, the inflation reduction act, and it had, you know, it had the talk about how they're going to extract more money from the population, but then the money that they were going to spend the 300 ish billion, uh, was put into basically renewables and, and, uh, you know, I, I, renewable energy, but it, on the theme of electrification. And uh, I was just reading this morning before we started our talk, you know, the Biden's talking about put, building chargers. The U.S. government's going to put X amount of money into building uh, EV charging stations. So it seems when you when you involve governments, it seems that, you know, no matter if it's a recession or not, the spending will continue. And uh, to me, that's also another bullish factor. Do you see it in the same light? I would agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the tracking the lithium price, where do you think is the best place for, for people to find that lithium price? Cause it, for, for me, I'm not sure myself and I've, I've tried to find it's mostly in articles that I, I pick up on the lithium price, but where could someone follow the lithium price? Um, if you go to, so for the average retail investor, if you want an idea of lithium chemical prices, at least in China, um, trading economics.com, I get that right? Yeah. Tradingeconomics.com, they do have that. Um, but you're right. It's a very opaque market. Um, it's not, lithium is not a commodity. There's several different, it, it trades differently in every country. Um, it trades differently depending on the chemical makeup. Um, and what, and of course the actual lithium chemical. So uh, another place is to look at 
you know, you're not going to get daily prices, but you can look at Pulbera, Pulbera's uh, spodumene auction prices, which is what a lot of people pay attention to. Um, I rely on Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. In my view, they're the best source. They compile uh, everything. They compile prices all across the spectrum. But, uh, you know, you'll get weekly updates from them. It's going to cost you, though. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so for the average retail investor listening to this, I'd say your best bets are Pulbera and Trading Economics. Okay, that's great. Um, so Red Cloud is, is, offers a number of different things to retail investors. Um, I attend as many conferences as I can. The, you know, the, the pre-PDAC, I'm sure, is, is going to be happening in the next three months. Where can uh, retail investors go to find out more about Red Cloud's offerings and conferences? Sure. So if you want to learn about our conferences, go to redcloudfs.com. We do, you know, more than just conferences. You'll see, you'll see we do a podcast, we do um, webinars and interviews. Uh, we are on all your social media. We even have a TikTok now. <laughs> and uh, of course, Twitter, Instagram. And then on my side, so I work on the Red Cloud security side, which is a, the brokerage arm. You can go to redcloudresearch.com. And from there, you can register for an account. It's it's free. We don't charge people for it. Um, and you can read our research. You can read the, the stocks that we like um, all at redcloudresearch.com. Excellent. Kobe, I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I think we hit on a lot of good points for any investor in, in interested in lithium. Um, thanks for being with us and we hope to have you on in the new year. Thanks, Brian. Pleasure being here. Cheers. 